Mayong Adlaw, we are the group 2 of PI 100 Section A, and Charles or Lyric Ikotan with me is Ms. Asino, Ms. Ampon, Ms. Armeni, and Ms. Kunanan, and we will be presenting our answers to the workshop questionnaire. The presentation will be subdivided into three parts. First, who is Dr. Rizal? Second, Dr. Jose Rizal in Europe? And lastly, Rizal and his martyrdom. Who is Dr. Rizal? Jose Protasio Rizal Mercado y Alonso Rialonda, commonly known by all as Jose Rizal, was born on June 19, 1861 in Calamba, in the province of La Laguna. His mother is Teodora Morales Alonso Rialonda y Quintos, also known as Doña Teodora, and his father is Francisco Ingracio Rizal Mercado y Alejandro or Don Francisco. The social political situation. Centuries before Rizal was born, the social political situation in the Philippines has been turbulent as the Philippines was under Spanish colonial rule for centuries already. The Filipinos have become the subject of the Spanish colonial government, not through war but by the use of faith to conquer the archipelago. The establishment of colonial power in the Philippines had a profound impact on the social, economic, and political order and lives of natives. During the pre-colonial era, men and women frequently had diverse and critical functions in society. However, colonial power and its policies made a concerted effort to eradicate pre-colonial practices, beliefs, and culture. The pre-colonial Philippines experienced a drastic and overwhelming negative repercussion of colonial power that led to the marginalization of native Filipinos in both the private and public realms. White dominance was a norm throughout the Spanish rule where they monopolized the economy, politics, and social life of the native. Under Spanish colonial control, there were cases of enslavement of the Filipinos by the encomenderos. Filipinos lived under the constrained limits and experienced extreme prejudice and subjugation, and this was the state of social political environment when Jose Rizal was born. The Occupation of Parents and Social Class Both of Jose's parents have an occupation. Teodora, Jose Rizal's mother, runs a shop in town while Francisco was a farmer and leased lands from the Dominicans. The family of Jose Rizal belonged to the Principalia and was a renowned family in Calamba, La Laguna. Jose's parents were able to build a huge stone house and buy another one as a mark of their affluence, made a private library as well as a carriage, which is a status symbol in the Spanish Philippines, and they were able to send their children to colleges in Manila. Jose Rizal's siblings. Jose Rizal had 10 siblings. They are Saturnina, Pasiano, Narcisa, Olympia, Lucia, Maria, Concepcion, Josefa, Trinidad, and Soledad. Among Jose Rizal's siblings, Saturnina was the eldest, who was born in 1850, while Soledad was born in 1870, making her the youngest sibling of Jose Rizal. Jose Rizal had nine sisters. They are Saturnina, Narcisa, Olympia, Lucia, Maria, Concepcion, Josefa, Trinidad, and Soledad. While Jose Rizal only had one brother, Pasiano. Among his sisters, Saturnina Rizal was said to be the closest sister to Jose. She contributed financially to Jose's trip to Europe, even sending her diamond ring for Jose to use in case of emergency, and Saturnina wrote letters to Rizal while he is overseas. Jose Rizal's first teacher, like almost every other child, was his mother, Doña Tidora. In Rizal's time, it was unusual to come across a highly educated woman of good culture like Doña Tidora, who could teach Spanish, reading, poetry, and values through rare storybooks. Rizal had learned the alphabet and prayers under her supervision when, his, when he was only three years old. Doña Tidora was a strict teacher, but she was also affectionate and patient. Little Rizal didn't know much Spanish in, term, in terms of conversational usage, but his mother sought to impress on him the beauty of Spanish poets and encouraged him in rhyming essays that eventually blossomed into pretty acceptable poetical writings. Rizal received additional instruction from private tutors in Calamba after learning the letters and prayers from his mother. He was then sent to Maestro Siniano Aquino Cruz's private school in Binyan when he was 9 years old. The school was at the teacher's house, a modest Nipa cottage close to Jose's aunt's house where he resided. The maestro was a wise but strict teacher who helped Rizal enhance his knowledge of Latin and Spanish. Rizal was the brightest student in the school, outperforming his peers in Spanish, Latin, and other disciplines. However, he was also punished by the teacher several times because he got into conflict with other boys. Rizal learned everything Maestro Siniano could teach him in less than two years, and his teacher advised his father to send him to a good college in Manila for further study. When he was 11, he went to Manila and enrolled in Ateneo Municipal, which was run by Jesuit fathers, 
who were well-known educators. When he first arrived at Ateneo, he was noticeably behind in Spanish. He studied the language diligently, reading voraciously, but it wasn't until his third and fourth years, when he was in Father Francisco de Paula Sanchez's class, that his development became quick and he felt confident writing in Spanish. In 1880, Rizal entered another literary contest in the Liceo, open to all without distinction, with El Consejo de los Dioses, or the Council of Gods, an allegorical drama in praise of Cervantes that could not be more Spanish. Rizal's winning allegory was a literary masterpiece based on Greek classics. Rizal, despite being a student at the University of Santo Tomas, was assisted in obtaining the necessary reference materials by the generous rector of the Ateneo. He was especially pleased because he proved the fallacy of the alleged Spanish superiority over the Filipinos and demonstrated that the Filipino could compete fairly against all races. The Middle Ages were coming to an end in the Philippines in the last quarter of the 19th century. It is not surprising then that Rizal and his contemporaries remind us of the men of the Renaissance and Enlightenment. Stumbling out of the candlelit vaults of the Age of Faith, they blinked with amazed delight at the discovery of man and the world and the vanities that were not all vanities at the time of possession. They were carried away by the flood of new ideas made available with the Spanish Civil Wars and the inauguration of the Suez Canal. They were voracious for information and experience. By the mid-1870s, Indios were permitted to enter the university and pursue degrees in law, medicine, and pharmacy. Rizal entered the University of Santo Tomas after getting his Bachelor of Arts diploma from Ateneo. In the first year, he studied philosophy, and in the second year, he changed course and enrolled in medicine to be able to cure his mother's deteriorating eyesight. Simultaneously, he pursued a land surveyor and assessor's degree at Ateneo. But fed up with the Dominican teacher's discrimination against Filipino students, he dropped out of the USD in 1882. It is important to note that Rizal's other reason for not finishing medicine at USD was that the teaching method was outdated and repressive. On May 3, 1882, Rizal left Manila at only 20 years old. On June 16, 1882, Rizal finally reached his destination, Barcelona. Rizal decided to continue his medical education in Europe after finishing the fourth year of his medical course at USD. Pasciano, his older brother, assisted him in preparing his travel documents. He advised Rizal to apply for a passport using the surname Mercado because his younger brother's exploits had made Rizal a name to be avoided. Rizal left for Spain in 1882 and enrolled in medicine and philosophy and letters at the Universidad Central de Madrid that same year. According to a letter from Pasciano to Rizal dated May 26, 1882, Rizal was supposed to continue his studies in Barcelona, but Pasciano advised him to go to Madrid instead because it would be more convenient for him to be there with their countrymen who could show him around until he got the hang of things. In June of 1884, Rizal got the degree of licentiate in medicine at the age of 23. A year later, he graduated with an excellent grade from his philosophy and letters course. Seeking to treat his mother's worsening blindness, Rizal traveled to Paris, Heidelberg, and Berlin to improve his education and acquire additional ophthalmology training. Rizal was in Europe for five years before he returned to the Philippines in August 1887. The opening of professional schools in Manila to Indios around 1875 did not deter the constant flow of young native students to Europe, where the political and, and educational environment did not appear to be as suffocating as that in the colony. The number of natives who went to study in Spain increased as a result of continued harassment from colonial authorities and friars. 3, 1882, Rizal left Manila at only 20 years old. He boarded the Salvadora bound for Singapore. In Singapore, Rizal bound a Gemna, a French steamer which was sailing to Europe on May 11, 1882. By May 17, 1882, Gemna reached Point Cae. On, on June 11, Rizal re reached Naples. On the night of June 12, the steamer docked at the French har harbor of Marseille. In the afternoon of May 15, 1882, Rizal left Marseille by train for the last lap of his trip of Spain, to Spain. On June 16, 1882, Rizal finally reached his destination, Barcelona. The three priests, namely Father Jose Burgos, Father Mariano Gomez, and Father Jacinto Zamora, were publicly grilled on February 17, 1872. Mutiny broke out in the military arsenal at Cavite, 
on the beaches of Manila Bay, south of the city, in January 1872. The mutiny was soon put down, but during the ensuing investigation into its reasons, Spanish officials claimed to have discovered evidence of a massive plot against the government, including prominent intellectuals. The three priests were charged with participating in the Cavite mutiny and were prosecuted by a military trial in which they had no opportunity to defend themselves. On February 17, 1872, they were found guilty of treason as the instigators of the Cavite mutiny and publicly garroted. Many people assumed that the priests were somehow involved in the Cavite insurrection. Those who had misgivings remained mute. Yet, according to the Filipino intellectuals, the fathers were persecuted and murdered because they were leaders of the Filipino clergy in a dispute with the Spanish friars, not because of anything to do with the Cavite mutiny, to which they had no relation. The execution of Gomborza was ordered by the Spanish colonial authorities, particularly Governor General Rafael de Esquerdo, as he authorized this, as he authorized this execution. Rizal was associated with other Filipino students, such as Don Pedro Alejandro Paterno, Graciano Lopez Haina, Gregorio Sanchanco, Juan Luna, Melicio Figueroa, Felix Resurrection Hidalgo, Miguel Zaragoza, Estevan Villanueva, and Marcelo, Marcelo Hilario del Pilar. During Rizal's time in Madrid, several organizations were established that aimed to fight for the rights and interests of the Filipino people. Here are some of the notable organizations. First, the La, Solad, La, Solad, Tar, La, Solad, La Solidaridad. It was a civic organization founded in 1888 that aimed to unite and educate Filipino living in Spain. Its members included Filipinos and Spaniards who believed in the needs for reforms in the Philippines. Second, Circulo Hispano Filipino. It was a social organization established in 1889 that aimed to foster better understanding and relations between Filipinos and Spaniards. Its members were mostly Spanish intellectuals and artists. Third, Asociación Hispano-Filipino. It was founded in 1890 and as a response to the Circulo Hispano-Filipino, which excluded Filipino members. It aimed to promote the interests of Filipinos in Spain and to fight against discrimination. The association between Jose Rizal, Graciano Lopez Saina, and Marcelo H. Del Pilar was referred to as a triumvirate because the three of them were considered the leaders of the propaganda movement, which aimed to bring reforms and improve the lives of Filipinos under Spanish colonial rule. In the context of the propaganda movement, Rizal, Haina, and Del Pilar were seen as powerful trio who worked together to promote the cause of Filipino nationalism and to demand reforms from the Spanish colonial government. The Barcelona colony established La Solidaridad, a Masonic character of which Rizal accept, accepted the leadership, and with outside financial support, began publishing a fortnightly newspaper of the same name, which made its debut in February 1889. La Solidaridad's political platform included the following demands. First, assimilation. Second, representation of the Philippines in the Spanish Cortes. Participation in government affairs. Equality before the law freedom of assembly, freedom of the pr press, freedom of speech, and removal of the friars from the parishes. The social movement that the triumvirate led was called the Propaganda Movement. The Propaganda Movement was a socio-political campaign aimed at raising awareness and advocating for reforms in the Spanish colonial government in the Philippines during the late 19th century. The movement sought to educate the Filipinos about their rights and the need for reforms in the government including the demands for representation in the Spanish Cortes, for the abolition of the oppressive colony poli colonial policies, and the promotion of national identity and unity. Rizal enrolled in the course leading to a licentiate in medicine at Central University of Madrid, as well as the course in philosophy and literature. Not content with that, he studied, he studied painting and sculpture at the Academy de San Fernando, French, English, and German at the Ateneo de Madrid, and fencing at the Sanz and Carbonell schools. While Rizal was in Spain, his family faced the Calamba Hacienda issue. The Hacienda, which covered a vast area of land, was owned by the Dominican religious order and leased out to tenant farmers who worked on the land and paid rent to the landlords. 
the tenant farmers, many of whom were descendants of original landowners, claimed that they had legal rights to to the land and they that they should be recognized as the rightful owners. However, the Dominican landlords refused to acknowledge these claims and insisted on maintaining control over the land. Courts were, were involved in, the, in this dispute. The results were their first casualties purposely, purposefully selected as the prominent family in the community and as the family of the rebel leader. They were target of an eviction lawsuit brought before the Calamba Justice of the Peace Court, which in the Dominican's opinion failed because Pashan Rizal personally dictated the verdict. The Dominicans were successful in their appeal before the Court of First Instance in Santa Cruz, the provincial capital. The Supreme Court rejected the results appeal which they then filed. The case was transported to Spain but again again to no avail. The catastrophe was handled well by Rizal's father. They were both in good health according to Hidalgo's letter to Rizal. Don Francisco did not appear to be getting older. He was always cheerful but firm and energetic. And when his lawyer ha had advised him to make overtures to the estate administrator after this eviction, Don Francisco had responded that he would never go to such lands and had moved in with his daughter, Narcisa. At the age of 11, Rizal saw his mother, Doña Teodora, arrested and placed into a common jail. Don Jose Alberto, his uncle, had returned from Europe. During this, his uncle's absence, his wife had, has violated her duty as a mother and wife, deported their house, and abandoned their children. Don Jose Alberto sought for his wife after becoming concerned about her whereabouts. He attended to divorce his wife after finding her. However, Doña Tredora convinced him to take her back. A few days after, Don Jose Alberto's wife, together with a lieutenant of the civil guard, had accused him of attempting to poison her and named Doña Teodora as an accomplice of this act. For this reason, Doña Teodora was sent to prison by a fanatical mayor named Don Antonio Vivencio del Rosario. Doña Teodora was, was ordered to be sent to the provincial prison immediately, not by boat as is typical, but on foot along the lake. The journey from, the journey from Calamba to Santa Cruz was lengthy. While completing his medic medical studies in Germany, the 25-year-old Rizal learned about an Australian researcher in Litmiritz, whose historical and ethnographic writings on the Philippines revealed his lifelong fascination with the people in a place he had never visited on his own. Rizal sent Lumintrit, an aromatic book authored in Tagalog and Spanish by a Filipino from Santa Cruz, Lag Laguna, on July 31, 1886. He took the opportunity of sending him the book after learning that the esteemed professor had been studying Tagalog and had written numerous words about it. A few days later, he received an ecstatic response from Blumentritt to whom he immediately answered, thus commencing the most notable and prolific correspondence and letters, which lasted until Rizal's death. The two had met on May 14, 1887, in Lyft Meritz. Of this encounter, Coates remarked, What they had sense of each other in correspondence proved to be true. They were two spirits closer than kin. At Let Meretz was sealed the fr friendship that was to be the closest in Rizal's life, aside from that of his brother Prashan, and for Blumentritt it was the same. The two, in fact, looked upon each other as brothers. According to Guerrero, Rizal was attractive to women and attracted by them. Rizal's first infatuation was Segunda Katigbak, a, Batangue a Batanguenya a two year younger than him, Kolehayala. Rizal met her with Segunda's brother, Mariano Katigbak, when visiting his maternal grandmother at Trozo, Manila. He was just 16 years old. So his extensive travels around the Philippines and the rest of the world led him to form several relationships that, that shaped nearly half of his life. These women are the following Rizal met Leonor Orang Valenzuela, his next-door neighbor, as a sophomore studying medicine at the University of Santo Tomas. It is claimed that Rizal memorialized Leonor Rivera in Nole Metangere as Maria Clara. Rizal and Leonor met in Manila when he was 18 and she was 13. While Rizal was a student at Universidad Central de Madrid in 1882, he met Consuelo Ortega y Rey. In several entries in his journal, Rizal described being enchanted by Japan's splendor and sense of order. On, he on Jose Rizal's second overseas journey, he met Seiko Usui or Osei-san. In February 1888, he landed in Japan from Hong Kong. 
and he had to leave for San Francisco due to his duties in the country. After visiting Japan and the United States, Rizal stayed in London in May 1888, and at 27 years old, he met Gertrude Beckett, the oldest daughter of Charles Beckett. In 1890, he moved into a boarding home in Belgium, and in which Rizal was reported to have had a brief affair with his landlady's petite niece, Suzanne Hakobi, a Belgian woman whom Rizal met when he was 29. So as Rizal continued to write El Filibusterismo as well as for La Solidaridad, he also worried about his family at home. After a rough time in Madrid, Rizal took a break in 1891 and traveled to Biat Biarritz, where he stayed with the Busteds at their holiday home. Nelly Busted was the youngest what well, younger daughter, and there was almost a duel between Jose Rizal and Antonio Luna because Luna fell violent, violently in love with Nelly. However, marriage was still out of question for Rizal. One of Rizal's most heartbreaking times was spent in exile in the Pitan, and she, there she, he met Josephine Bracken with her blind adoptive father, Mr. George Toffer. She landed in the Pitan speeches in the last days of February 1895. Now we've reached the point where Rizal was contemplating on returning to the Philippines despite the fact that there could be no progress, not even common justice under a regime dominated by the Spanish friars. And worse, he had turned them into the bitterest of enemies. This is Rizal and his martyrdom. Rizal's first homecoming was when he arrived in Manila on the evening of August 5, 1887, on board the Haiphong, which he had boarded at Saigon after a five-year journey in Europe. But he did not remain in Manila for long, and on August 8, 1887, he traveled to Calamba to see his family. His second arrival on June 21, 1892, will be further discussed later. So, despite the unanimous advice from his loved ones, according to Guerrero, Rizal was too homesick to consider the repercussions of his return to the Philippines despite the cautions of his loved ones. In his diary, he wrote, I sigh for my distant country, now I remember home, and now my thoughts turn to rest. Another factor is that he had already completed his ophthalmology medical course and now he could, he could operate on his mother's poor eye condition. In addition, Rizal believed that it was his responsibility to return to Calamba as early as 1884 because of poor business conditions and fo falling sugar prices. He also intended to dem demonstrate that he feared nothing and no one and that there was no need to fear. He indicated in a letter to Blumentritt that he is more useful in my country than here. Here, nobody needs me. Theodora Alonso, Rizal's mother, had a cataract problem which threatened to make her completely blind. That is why Rizal studied medicine and especially ophthalmology to treat this condition. So after his return to Manila, he immediately left for Calamba and there he established a medical clinic. He successfully removed the cataract of his mother, which is his first surgical operation, and in 1892, he performed another cataract surgery on his mother's left eye. However, the right eye, which was operated while he was in the Pitan, developed endophthalmitis in 1984. For context, touching on Governor General Terrero and the, the Dominicans are vital. The Dominicans at UST submitted a report to the Governor General on August 30, 1887, declaring that Noli Matangheri was heretical, impious, and scandalous from the religious perspective, anti-patriotic, and subversive in the political side. Beyond his work, the Dominicans had, had formed a deep loathing for Rizal. It was also related to the conditions in Calamba. In 1887, the Governor General was Lieutenant General Emilio Terrero y Perinat, and it was stated that he was transformed into a liberal, reform minded, and anti clerical Governor General. Noli Matangere was not prohibited in the archipelago despite the suggestion by the censorship commission. If it were not for Dreyer's efforts in 1887, Rizal would have been punished sooner. It is also important to note the hints of agrarian trouble in Calamba. Even before Rizal's return, there were already signs between the tenants and the estate. On December 30, 1887, Terrero, who had heard of the facts in Rizal's Noli Matangere, ordered an investigation into the conditions in Calamba, and soon after, Rizal became the, the center of the struggle between the people of Calamba versus the Dominicans. 
Terraro advised Rizal to leave the country because he could no longer hold off the friars. So Rizal left Manila in February 1888 for Hong Kong. However, in May 1892, Rizal expressed his desire to go back to the country. He wanted to address the plight of the tenant farmers of Calamba, for they were unjustly evicted and the homes of the tenant farmers were destroyed. So, to get permis permission from the Spanish Governor General to leave the Philippines, Rizal was committed to offering a better life for the displaced residents of Calamba, and if visiting the Spuhol in person in Manila was necessary, he would do so. So, Rizal's home, second homecoming was with his was with his widowed sister Lucia on June 21, 1892. He arrived in Manila on Sunday, June 26, 1892. On Tuesday, July 5, 1892, According to the Governor General's private orders, the constabulary conducted simultaneous raids on the homes of everyone he had visited. Afterward, it was discovered that his baggage included copies of a leaflet that ridiculed the friars, the Holy Father, and the Supreme Pontiff himself. They, had, they now had more grounds to expel Rizal. The Spool issued a banishment sentence that handed the Spanish friars a win. On the evening of July 7, 1892, the Spool's decree explained how Rizal had published several books and had attributed to him proclamations and pamphlets that were of very doubtful Hispanism and, while not openly anti Catholic, brazenly anti friar. The decision has shown, however, that Rizal's entire collection of works constitutes the actual proof against him. So Rizal was placed aboard a boat bound for the Pitan on July 15, 1892. Over most of the three centuries of Spanish rule in the Philippines, the Roman Catholic Church was deeply engaged in colonial administration. The agricultural conflict between 1887 and 1891 at the Hacienda de San Juan Bautista in the province of Laguna was the most vocal demonstration of peasant resentment. The worsening land conflict in the town of Calamba, Laguna between the Hacienda management and the group of tenants is known to be the central conflict in the agrarian aspect during the 19th century. Among those affected by the conflict was Rizal's family. It was found that there is Dominican corruption and financial deceit on a massive scale. Dominican order comprises not only the lands but also the town of Calamba, an arbitrary increase in the rentals paid by the tenants. The Dominicans only paid the government the income tax due on the original smaller Ascenda. Ascenda's owners never contributed a single centavo for town fiestas, children's education, and agricultural improvement. The Ascenda management confiscated carabaos, tools, and homes if rentals could not be paid. The immediate result of the agrarian issues at Ascenda de Calamba was the eviction of over 300 households who were tenants and subtenants of the estate. They were replaced by renters who have better finances. This caused an exceptional growth in the Ascenda's revenue between 18 1892 and 1896, which eventually led to the Philippine Revolution of 1896. The agrarian dispute at Ascenda de Calamba was the climax of hatred against the friars. Rizal organized the La Liga Filipina. This constituted a forward step in the reformist ideas of the times in the sense that a new group sought to involve the Filipino people directly in the reform movement. In effect, it would be an imperium in imperio, an underground government running parallel with the established regime. La Liga Filipina was founded on the evening of July 3, 1892 in Tondo, Manila. La Liga, as Rizal had sought to, purpose, to represent it to the Spanish authorities as a as a peaceful association with purely civic aims. On your screen are its objectives. On July 3, 1892, the same day that the organization was established, they hailed their founding officers. Ambrosio Salvador as president, Diodato Arellano as secretary, Agustin de la Rosa for fiscal, Bonifacio Flores Arevalo as its treasurer. Rizal only served as their consultant. The La Liga Filipina was organized by Rizal as a society that embodied the ideals Rizal had set forth in El Filibus Turismo. As Rizal envisioned it, the Liga was, so, was to be a sort of mutual aid and self-help self -help society, dispensing scholarship funds, legal aid, loaning capital, setting up cooperatives, but these were harmless, even naive goals that could do nothing to alleviate the socio-economic ills of the time. But the Spanish authorities were so alarmed by them that they imprisoned Rizal on July 6, 1892. Organized as a secret society, it demanded, it demanded blind, blind obedience of its members who obliged themselves to give preference to fellow members in buying and selling, to come to the aid of any member in need, not to submit to any humiliation, nor to treat any other so as to humiliate him. So in your on your screen are 
the funds collected by the organization to be used for things like su to support a member, to give aid to those who had suffered, to grant loans, and the like. There is no thought of a violent overthrow of the Spanish regime. Rather, Rizal proposes a means to achieve the national community that he deemed a prerequisite to any attempt at independence. The Spanish regime of church and state seemed incapable of providing the education, the economic progress, the personal security, and safeguarding of rights that a nation owes its citizens. So Rizal proposed that the Liga, the formation of a competitive and substitutive community to, feel, f to fulfill those functions, which would aid the necessary growth to enable a Filipino na national community to come to maturity and supplant the existing regime. At first, the Liga was quite active. With Rizal deported to the Pitan, the Liga became inactive until through the efforts of Domingo Franco and Andres Bonifacio. Bonifacio in particular exerted great efforts to organize chapters in various districts of Manila and a few months later, however, the Supreme Council of the Liga dissolved the society. The reformist leaders found out that most of the popular councils which Bonifacio had organized were no longer willing to send funds to the Madrid propagandists because, like Bonifacio, they had become convinced that peaceful agitation for reforms was futile. Afraid that the more radical rank and file members might capture the organization and unwilling to involve themselves in an enterprise which would surely invite reprisals from the authorities, the leaders of the Liga opted for dissolution. The Liga membership split into two groups. The conservatives formed the Cuerpo de Compromisarios, which pledged to continue supporting the Solidaridad, while the radicals led by Bonifacio devoted themselves to a new and secret society, the Kataas Taasan Kagalang Galangang Katipunan, which Bonifacio had organized on the very day Rizal was deported to the Pitan. So with the shift from the Liga to the Katipunan, the goal was transformed from assimilation to separation. The means underwent a similarly drastic change from peaceful agitation for reforms to armed revolution. So this is how the reformism of the Illustrados gave way to the revolution of the masses. So in the previous discussion, the, so so the social political condition during this time is mainly characterized by the Argarian dis disputes that involve the native peasants. The masses became convinced that the only solution to their problems was revolution. On the 17th day of July, without the benefit of trial. Rizal's exile in Tapitan is largely attributed to the role played by the new governor general in the Philippines, Eulogio Despujol, who succeeded Whaler, and the Spanish officials and pires who were not in favor of Rizal. The new governor general had given Rizal the impression that there is renewed hope for the country when Despujol announced a good program of government for the Filipinos. Compared to the governor general before him, who was described as iron fisted, this pool had more liberal ideas than those who came before him. Upon his arrival in the Philippines, he tried to address the dissatisfaction of the Filipinos with the previous governor generals and friars. As a result, this pool was able to please the Filipinos but irked some friars. Prior to his return, Rizal wrote Governor Despujol a letter wherein he asked for permission and safe conduct to Manila. Through the Spanish consul at Hong Kong, he received a reply to his request and special passport or safe conduct to go back to Manila. Unbeknownst to Rizal, the consul's cablegram had notified the governor general that Rizal had fallen into the trap. When the safe conduct was issued and sent, the secret case against Rizal in Manila, accusing him for anti-religious and anti-patriotic agitation was also filed. On the same day, Despujol sent his executive secretary, De La Torre, to confidentially inquire if Rizal was truly naturalized as a German citizen, so that he would know what effect it would have on his right to take executive action and what action could be taken against one that is under the protection of his German nation. Thus, Rizal's fate, his exile to the Pitan, was already set in stone even before he came to Manila. Rizal, however, knew that he would not likely remain alive upon his return to the homeland. This was manifested when he prepared two documents that he intended to be made known to the public in the event that he would be killed by his enemies. In the first document, he wrote, The step I am about to take is undoubtedly attended with peril, and I need not to say to you that I take it after long deliberation. The first one of these documents was addressed to the Filipinos, his fellow countrymen that he had served and dedicated much of his life to. He wrote, What matter? 
Father's death if one dies for what one loves for native land and drinks killed one. The second document was addressed to his family. One of the lines noted, I realize how much suffering I have caused you. Still, I do not regret what I have done. Thus, Rizal knew that he was entering a lion's den, but still went with the faith of the government's promise of a safe return and a compelling sense of duty. On June 26, 1892, Rizal arrived in Manila accompanied by one of his sisters, Lucia. After knowing Rizal's return to the Philippines, Spanish officials and friars who were against Rizal had some people watch his every move. Unfortunately for them, they found nothing against Rizal and they could not prove that he was against the government. A significant event that solidified Rizal's exile in Lupitan was the five copies of leaflets entitled Pobres Frailes or Poor Friars that were crumpled up, allegedly found in his sister's bedding, which were considered as treasonable documents. Now, the customs investigation during this time was thorough and strict, but Rizal and his sister were permitted to go. It was only later on during his final interview with the governor general that this pool showed Rizal the found sheets of Pobres Frailes. The governor general asserted that the leaflets found in his sister's things proved, along with Rizal's visits in the provinces and the secret meetings of Filipinos, that he was against the government and the church. Now, while other works mention Dispujol's duplicity, Guerrero 1963 argues that Dispujol is one of the most misunderstood figures in Philippine history. Dispujol had shown Rizal generosity and to his banished family. There was also the consideration he showed regarding the satirist of friars and the religion to which he so devoutly adhered. Dispujol may have believed that Rizal had abused his good faith and their influence of the Spanish friars that could have appealed to his religious sentiments. The friars were also pleased with their triumph when this pool ordered for Rizal's banishment. So without trial or hearing, Rizal was ordered to be taken as a prisoner to Fort Santiago. While at Fort Santiago, Rizal was prohibited from having contact with any of his relatives and friends. The guards kept an eagle eye on Rizal. So Rizal was kept eight days in the fort and on July 14th, he was notified that he would be taken to the Pitan. A decree was issued to that ordered his exile in the Pitan under the charge of sacrilege and sedition on top of the leaflets found on Lucia's beddings. Now what did Rizal do while he was in the Pitan? Even though he was exiled in the Pitan, Rizal continued a life of steady work. He was under the parole that he was allowed to go to places without being watched, but he must not try to escape. So according to Rizal and Rodriguez 1923, in their work on Rizal, Rizal never had a guard in the Pitan. Even though he was placed in exile because he was perceived to be a dangerous person and threat, he was trusted even by the commandants. Even those in high rank, the officers saw Rizal's charm and managed to have good relationships with them. Rizal opened up a clinic in the Pitan. So when he found out that that place had no doctor, he saw it as an opportunity to help out the people and prevent them from depending on herbularios or quack doctors. He opened up a clinic and treated patients only asking a small fee for those who could afford it but offered his services free for the poor. He also taught children. When Rizal found out that the children in the Pitan did not have the means for getting proper education, he gathered them and taught. With the money he earned, he also built a school where he taught arithmetic, Spanish, and English. Rizal also studied the animal life of the region. He collected specimens he found and wrote elaborate notes and illustrations about flowers, plants, insects, and crustaceans. The German museums were so amazed by his work that they gave him an offer to gather specimens for them in exchange for a fee. Three creatures that were previously unknown were named after Rizal. One is a frog called the Rakoperis Rizali, the second is a celiopter called the Apogonis Rizali, and the third a dragon called the Draco Rizali. He also devoted time to his literary and artistic pursuits. Rizal wrote a poem while he was at the Pitan entitled My Retreat. He dedicated it to his mother. He practiced his artistic crafts such as busts and medallions that he modeled after people. The bust of Father Guriko was one such sculpture that he made while in the Pitan. He also offered his arti artistic skills to the church such as modeling the right foot of the Holy Virgin to the sisters in charity and designing an exquisite curtain. He also implemented civic projects in the Pitan. When Rizal saw how the Pitan was unkempt and outdated, he sought to improve it. Rizal devised, planned, and constructed the Pitan's first lighting and water systems. With the help of Father Sanchez, he remodeled the town plaza in an attempt to enhance the town's beauty. He also learned how to 
sail a ship and taught the fishermen how to use and make a better net that they can utilize for trade. Notably, Rizal was visited by Dr. Pio Valenzuela, a member of the Katipunan and the personal emissary to Andres Bonifacio. Bonifacio had sent Valenzuela to inform him and seek advice on the revolution that was about to happen. Valenzuela also advised Rizal to escape as soon as he could and to be careful with dealing with Spanish authorities because once the revolution broke out, they knew that he would be implicated. Rizal completely opposed Bonifacio's plans for the revolution as he saw defects and their resources were not enough. Thus, he predicted that the revolt would likely fail. Who is Josephine Bracken? Josephine Bracken was the adopted daughter of an American named George Toffer. Josephine was the biological daughter of an Irish woman who died in Hong Kong after giving birth. She was later taken in by Toffer and his Portuguese wife, and she later on developed a relationship with Rizal and stayed with him in the Eton. Rizal and Josephine met when Mr. Toffer sought the professional help of Rizal. Now, Josephine had persuaded her father to pay Rizal a visit in hopes that he will be able to help regain his eyesight. Rizal was a well-known ophthalmic surgeon even in Hong Kong. Rizal and Josephine fell in love upon meeting each other and decided to become husband and wife after a month. Unfortunately, Father Obak, the parish priest of the Pitan, refused to preside over their marriage without obtaining the consent of the bishop of Cebu. Unfortunately, the relationship between Rizal and Josephine did not last long. Aside from mourning the loss of his son after Josephine had a miscarriage, Rizal's family also played a critical part that affected their relationship. One of Rizal's sisters, Maria Cruz, felt a sense of pretense in Josephine. Because Josephine arrived in the Pitan with Manuela Orlock, a mistress and confidant of one of the Spanish fire cannons of Manila Cathedral, Maria suspected that Josephine was an agent being used by the friars. Maria later on convinced Rizal that Josephine was merely a threat to her brother's safety. So during the introduction of Josephine to Rizal's family, despite showing politeness, no family member understood Rizal's fondness for her. They thought Josephine was unsuitable for Rizal because of her easygoing Hong Kong ways. Now, this affected the family's perspective and treatment of Josephine as they saw her unreliable and superficial. Lumen Tate wrote to Rizal about the devastation of Cuba and the people there in 1895. There was the scarcity of surgeons and the health situation there was dire. Blumentritt then advised him to volunteer as an army physician during the Cuban War in 1895. Rizal agreed and saw it as an opportunity to free himself from captivity. Through General Blanco, Rizal sent a formal application, though he did not have much hope that it would be accepted. The government of Spain sent their approval to permit Rizal to serve as a medical officer in Cuba. Now, Rizal's request to serve as a medical officer was initially accepted by Spain, but later on turned it turned down his offer when the Spanish authorities attempted to seize a growing revolutionary movement. Suspected persons were arrested and the roads were guarded and inspected. While Rizal sailed for Spain, the revolution in the Philippines had spread from Luzon to other islands. And while nobody knew of the name of the organization responsible for the revolution, Rizal's name was known by everyone. And Rizal was assumed to be the secret leader of the organization against the Spanish government. Rizal arrived in Manila in November 3, 1896, and was sent to Fort Santiago immediately. He was placed under arrest because of the evidence against him. According to Judge Advocate Francisco Olive, there was the evidence of letters that Rizal wrote to and received from his family and friends. There was the patriotic condemnation poem he wrote, as well as other books and articles that ridiculed the Catholic Church and Spaniards. And there were also the testimonies of those who were accused with him. Rizal was accused of being one of the leaders of the revolution. He was sentenced to death because of the revolution he had inspired but took no part in. He was also charged with organizing illegal societies that incited rebellion and revolution in the Philippines. While Rizal's retraction letter is controversial, it was unlikely that Rizal had written a retraction letter. The Dominicans at the time were pleased with the death sentence of Rizal, but they knew that his works and their influence would remain. As such, they sought to have him admit that he had made mistakes against the religion and have them retract. For them, this would then invalidate everything Rizal had written and published. A lot of Jesuits visited Rizal in an attempt to make him retract, but Rizal always deflected their persistence. Rizal knew that they wanted to discredit him and his writings in the eyes of the people present and those of the future. So Rizal knew that there was always the risk of falling victim to fraud. Fathers Balaguer and Villa Clara persuaded Rizal to return to the Catholic faith, but Rizal resisted. 
When Balaguer returned once more, Rizal asked for a formula of retraction. So when the formula for the retraction arrived, Rizal objected to some content and suggested changes be made. It stated, I declare myself a Catholic and in this religion in which I was born and educated, I wish to live and die. I retract with all my heart whatever in my words, writings, publications, and conduct has been contrary to my condition as son of the church. I believe and profess whatever she teaches and submit myself to whatever she commands. I abhor masonry as the enemy that it is of the church and the society prohibited by the same church. The diocesan prelate, as a superior ecclesiastical authority, can make public this my spontaneous declaration to repair the scandal that my actions may have caused, and so that God and men may forgive me. This was the content of the retraction letter that some had believed was written by Rizal. The significant works of Rizal that caught the ire of Spain are the El Consejo de los Joses, Nolimitangere, and El Filibusterismo. The poem that Rizal had written in 1879, the El Consejo de los Joses, zeroed in on the idea of being against the colonial system. Nolimi Tangere was thought to be insulting to the Spaniards and Catholic Church. And his Nolimi Tangere also damaged the reputation of Spaniards and friars. Similarly, the El Filibusterismo, which Rizal dedicated to the three executed Filipino priests, displeased the government of Spain because they saw the three as traitors, but he considered them as martyrs. Governor Polovieja signed Rizal's execution on December 30, 1896 at Bagumbayan Field, now called Luneta. When Rizal marched towards the Bagumbayan Field, he was accompanied by Taviel de Andrade and the Jesuits Villa Clara and March. It was said that Rizal was calm and composed during the moments before he was to be shot by a firing squad. Rizal said he wished to die facing the firing squad, but the Spanish captain said his orders were to shoot him in the back. Rizal then replied that it was the traitors who were shot and he was not a traitor to Spain. The captain replied he had his orders and must obey them. Rizal also asked to be shot in the small of the back, not in the head to which the captain agreed. Rizal firmly refused to kneel or be blindfolded. In addition, when the army doctor and duty asked to feel his pulse, it was admirably steady. So when the bullets hit their mark, Rizal made a last effort to turn around, thus falling lifeless with his back on the ground and his face to the sky. It was said that among those closest to the scene and who had heard his request to die facing the fire, the reaction was different. When some of the soldiers in the double squad raised a cheer with the rest, a Spanish sergeant who had seen many deaths in his time ordered them to silence. He had never seen a death quite like this, and it was that the brave recognized the brave.